So what can you buy for 50 cents anymore? Well, let me tell you, practically nothing. Even the dollar store went to a buck 25. I can remember when you could get a lot of things for 50 cents. Maybe I'm dating myself a little bit. A pack of gum. Well, the cheapest one I found now at Walmart is $1.38, and that only has a couple of sticks of gum in it. A cup of coffee. According to Google, the average price for a regular cup of coffee today is $3.08. A gallon of gas, $3.19. And yet you can still put a postage stamp on a postcard, stick it in a mailbox in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it will be delivered to Centerville, Virginia, a distance of 4,826 miles, for a grand total of 56 cents. Now that postcard will be traveling at a rate of 86 miles per penny. I wish my car got that kind of gas mileage. You know, for all the complaining that we do about our postal service, I have to tell you, that's still quite remarkable. You know the motto, right? Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor... Okay, maybe you don't know the motto. <laughs> Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night, stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. And I would say that our Postal Service lives up to this slogan pretty well. Somehow my credit card bill arrives on time every month, without fail. But you know what? It's not actually the U.S. Postal Service's slogan. We just appropriated it. No, this slogan is from a very different postal service. You see, this motto was attributed to the postal service of, and you guessed it, the ancient Persian Empire of 2,500 years ago, when it looked something more like this. The slogan was penned by the Greek historian Herodotus as he described the Persian emperor's courier service during the Greek-Persian Wars. And so, my friends, today we are going on a journey. The year is 479 before Christ. We're in the city of Susa, in the kingdom of Persia. And here we come to this little book of ours called the Book of Esther. It's a story of an orphan girl turned queen who saves the Hebrew people. It's a story of intrigue and danger, and deceit, and cunning, and betrayal. It makes for a great novella. But I have to tell you, the book of Esther is also a little bit weird to be in the Bible. Now, before I can explain, let's back up a minute and orient ourselves in biblical history. In 587 BC, about 100 years earlier, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonian Empire, and his army had conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. By this time, the United Kingdom of Israel had already been divided in the northern kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah had already separated. The northern kingdom had already been overrun by the Assyrians sometime earlier, and now the southern kingdom had fallen and with it the holy city of Jerusalem, and the temple had been destroyed. Many of the citizens of Judah were forced into exile in Babylon. But the Babylonian Empire was short-lived, because in 539 BC, about 50 years later, along comes a much grander empire, the great Persian Median Empire. And as you can see from the map, the Persian Empire dwarfed the Babylonian Empire. In fact, as its size will tell you, it had 2.1 million square miles, and it became the largest empire that the world had ever known. It covered what is now 15 modern-day countries and portions of three more. 
The Persian Median Empire spanned from all the way in the east to India to in the west, the Libyan coast of the Mediterranean Sea, up to the Black Sea in the north and down the Nile River Valley. This was a massive and powerful kingdom consisting of 127 provinces. To go from one end of the kingdom to the other by the fastest land route was well over 4,000 miles, almost as far as from here to Hawaii. And I guarantee you couldn't mail a postcard for 50 cents in the ancient Persian postal service. OK, so that's the background to our story. Here's how this all fits in and ties together. After the Babylonian Empire, the great king, Persia, king of Persia, King Cyrus, had decreed that the Israelites could return home from exile. When he conquered Babylon, he gave freedom to the Israelites. And so the Israelites began returning in waves from Babylon back to Israel. And in time, they would rebuild the city of Jerusalem. They would rebuild the temple. They would reestablish the nation of Israel. And as we learn from the Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah, these returnees considered themselves the true faithful, the followers of, of God, the chosen people, the elect, the favored ones. According to Ezra, intermingling, intermingling with non-Jews was forbidden, and intermarriage with foreigners was considered the greatest of shames and sins. And it would corrupt the holy Jewish race. Jewish purity was valued at all costs. Rebuilding the temple signaled the restoration of God's dominion and the seat of authority in Israel and beyond. And after years in exile in a foreign land under foreign rule, it's a compelling narrative for the Jews. Except, of course, for those who didn't return from exile. You see, Ezra and Nehemiah seem to have particular clarity over who they believed God favors. But then we must stumble over this little story called Esther. And it doesn't quite fit the narrative. And whenever we encounter something in the Bible that doesn't quite fit, that's when we need to pay attention. You see, some of the Israelites were pretty comfortable in Persia. After roughly a hundred years in exile, they knew little of the Israelite, the Israel they were being called to return to. Many had been born in and spent their entire lives in Babylon and Persia. Esther would have been among them. Esther and her uncle Mordecai are among the Hebrews who stayed in Persia and didn't return with the first wave of returnees. You see, they had made a comfortable life for themselves. They had embraced Persian customs and practices. They had taken on Persian names. In fact, the name Mordecai derives from the name Marduk, who is the chief god in the pantheon of Babylonian gods. And Mordecai had a position of some authority in the Persian royal court. Why should they leave? So what gives? God's favored people are heading back to Israel, rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, and reestablishing their religious identity. And here are these secular, assimilated stay-behinds. In this story, Esther will hide her Jewish identity. She will eat Persian foods, which surely break the Jewish dietary laws. She will be married to a Persian man, albeit likely without her consent. Her uncle is named after a foreign god. And if that's not enough, this entire book of Esther never mentions the name of God even once. So what is God doing here? How does this secular story end up in our Bible? And what can we possibly expect to learn from it? Well, the first thing we can learn is that it isn't up to us to decide who God will use for God's purposes. 
Time and again, God uses unexpected people who don't seem to fit the narrative. So if you've ever felt like you just don't quite fit in at church, if you just aren't good enough for God, if you feel judged and unworthy by church people, listen up. If you're a mediocre Christian, a one foot in the church, one foot in the world kind of Christian, if you don't feel like you have your act together, if you feel like you're too lost, too broken, too damaged, listen up. God has something to say, especially to you today. God isn't looking for perfect people. God is looking for willing people. God is in the business of making all things new. Or maybe you're a strong Christian, but you're the wrong kind of Christian. You've been judged for how you interpret the scriptures or your positions on social issues or the church you choose to attend. You see, some Christians believe that they are God's holy race, the chosen ones, the true remnant of God, who God has favored. And those who disagree, or those who come from different perspectives, well, they might as well be heretics. Don't be one of those Christians, and don't believe them either. Instead, turn your energy to loving God and loving God's people. God is the Lord of all God's children, and God is in the business of making all things new. Now, Esther, just like so many of those incredible and unexpected women in the Bible, like Sarah and Rahab and Ruth and Mary and so many others, is in the wrong place in the wrong time, and she's the wrong person for the job. And yet God will make her the right person in the right place, in the right time. And God will use her to save God's people. So keep your eyes open. God might be using the most unexpected people to effect change in our world. God is a God of surprises. Be alert. God wants to use you, too. And so we find ourselves in the city of Susa, the summer residence of the great king of Persia. By this time, Xerxes is king, and this is the site of Xerxes' magnificent palace, where his vast wealth is on opulent display. And it is here that we find the mighty king with his untold power and riches. But we also learn that King Xerxes could be cruel and erratic. He had a habit of making his most important decisions while stone cold drunk. He responded to dissension with harsh brutality, and he was very hard on women. In fact, our story begins with Xerxes dethroning his wife Vashti for refusing to appear before him most likely naked, except for her crown, according to Jewish Midrashic tradition, so that he might display her in her full beauty to his drunken nobleman friends. He then takes upon himself many concubines for, from every province of his kingdom, from which he might choose his new wife. Scholars believe that his harem may have included as many as 360 women, one for each day of the year. Esther is one of those young women taken from her home for her beauty to be in the king's harem. And her beauty ultimately catches the king's gaze and gets her chosen to be his queen. Now I need to pause us here for a minute because sometimes we tend to romanticize the Bible like a fairy tale. Some of the older commentaries I read as I studied for this sermon make it sound like Esther was the winner of a grand beauty pageant, and as a reward, she had won the heart of her Prince Charming. Friends, I can say with relative clarity, this isn't what's happening here. What we have is a very powerful man using his authority to subjugate many young girls to do his bidding. 
Now, obviously, social norms were very different in that day than they are from today. But for those of you who have had to live through Me Too moments, I think Esther could relate to your story. And Xerxes will soon turn his gaze elsewhere, giving Esther little further attention. In fact, as our story ramps up, he has not summoned her into his presence for a full 30 days. Even as queen, she may not enter into his court without his invitation under penalty of death. You see, though she was the most powerful woman in the kingdom, she had very little agency over her own life, and she was at the mercy of an unpredictable king. Furthermore, as an Israelite, she was a foreigner, and it was the tradition that the queen be a native-born native born Persian. Had Esther revealed her true identity, she may have been in grave danger. Now Esther's uncle Mordecai learns of a vengeful plot by Haman, the king's right-hand man, to have all the Israelites of the kingdom hunted down and killed. Mordecai asks Esther to intervene with the king, but Esther knows the danger of coming before the king unannounced with her request, and so she resists. Mordecai implores her to act, though, on behalf of the Jewish people with these words. For if you keep silent at a time such as this, relief and deliverance will rise up for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. And so Esther relents, and despite the dangers, devises a plan to come before the king and to plead for the lives of her fellow Israelites. But before she sets her plan in motion, she, must, she does something remarkable. Then Esther sends a reply to Mordecai, go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. Hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night nor day. I and my maids will also fast as you do, and after that I will go before the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She asked Mordecai to call together all of the Jews to fast. That's another way of saying she called them together to pray for her. Here is this secular Jew, this terrified young woman, who is about to interrupt the king under penalty of death. And her response? She prays. And she prays. And she prays. And she calls those around her to pray for her as well. In our second lectionary text this morning that Benji read for us from the New Testament, James writes in his epistle lesson, and he reminds us that we should all pray as well. For the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. So here's lesson number two for us this morning. If you're facing something hard, pray. If you're up against impossible odds, pray. If the test results come out wrong, if the relationship is on the skids, if money is too tight, if the relationship with the kids is broken, if they're making poor choices, pray. If you don't know how to pray, pray anyway. If you feel unworthy, pray anyway. God already knows your need. Just talk to God. Share your heart. Share your fears. Share your dreams. God is a God of miracles. And if things are going well, James reminds us we should pray them too. And then, for such a time as this, Esther acted. She put her plan in motion, and God's people were saved. 
For such a time as this, Esther defied the odds. For such a time as this, Esther faced down death so that God's mercy could rain down wherever there was greed and corruption. For such a time as this, Esther served others. You see, what made Esther great was not that she was a powerful queen who exerted her authority on behalf of her people. No, what made Esther great was that she was a terrified young foreign girl who wore a crown but had little other agency over her life and yet willingly laid it all aside for the sake of others. For such a time as this, Esther acted selflessly. For such a time as this, Esther displayed immense bravery. And for such a time as this, God is calling you. God is calling the broken, the inadequate, the half-hearted, the powerless, the unworthy. God is calling you. So what's broken in your world? What hurt needs healing? What lonely soul needs a visit? What injustice needs writing? God is calling you for such a time as this. In my role as a deacon, I have the privilege of talking with a lot of people in a lot of situations. People who are unhoused, people who are food insecure, people who have trouble making the rent, people who are drowning in medical bills, people who are struggling to assimilate into a new culture people who are having trouble making the rent, people who are doing it and maybe just making it until the car breaks down or their hours get cut at work or the kid gets sick. And you don't have to look far to find these people. These people are in our neighborhoods. These people are our friends. These people share the pews with us on Sunday mornings. And you don't need to look around to try to figure out who they are. Because first of all, you won't recognize them anyway. And second of all, that's not what God wants from us. God just wants us to love everyone. Really love everyone. And if you're one of the comfortable people like me, it's time to recognize that there is something broken in our community and in our country and in our world. And God wants you to be the answer. For such a time as this, God has put this church in this community to stand in the gap. For such a time as this, we offer food and clothing and diapers and financial assistance and household goods and English classes to hundreds of families and individuals each month. But in such a time as this, that's not enough. We must continue to dream God-sized dreams. We must continue to dream of justice. And we must offer all of ourselves to God's disposal. For such a time as this, God has put you in this place. You may not feel like you're anything special, but God knows better. And God doesn't make mistakes. So do like Esther, start on your knees, then get up and love your world. Dream God-sized dreams and serve God's broken people. Amen. Amen.